Hello, everybody. Hey, everybody. How's it going? Thank you. Thank you. Wow. What a warm and wonderful audience. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
Associate Dean for Advancement, Dr. Phoenix Delgado, um, the wonderful Sean David Christensen, thank you. Um, the, US, the USC Institute of Armenian Studies, Director Sushan Karapetchan, thank you. The Armenian Film Society, um, the founders of the Armenian Film Society, Armin and Mary, thank you, thank you. Our EP, Jane Solomon, for being the connector on all things. Um, Alex Ago, Richard, Talis, Maddie, all the associate programmers here, thank you. Um, let's do it. <laughs> let's get started. Okay, let's take it to the beginning. Ben and Chris, how? How did we get here? <laughs> well, Chris's parents started playing piano music in the womb. I'm, that, that's what I'm told. Um, and that was the precursor to, to, to Chris going, becoming a musician, going to LUSD, et cetera. It would be, I don't know, 30 years later, 28 years later, Jeremy Lambert, our producer, uh, saw an article about the repair shop. Um, and it was an older article about how there was a backlog at the repair shop. There had been budget cuts. There were fewer people to repair instruments. And uh, there were some photos in there, and he brought it uh, to my attention. And uh, I just was blown away both that uh, this was the last, well, the last of its kind in the United States and that it was in Los Angeles, which made me really proud uh, to live here. Um, you know, Angelinas are sometimes challenged to be proud of our city. Um, <laughs> and, you know, I'm from Nova Scotia in Canada, and so it took me a while to say, like, no, I, am, I, I do live here. I've lived here for 10 years. And, um, I was I felt a, a welling of pride, and so I immediately went to Chris. Um, we were making a film called "A Concerto as a Conversation" together, and I asked, you know, do you know anything about this shop? And Chris said, no. And you know, we started a conversation about um, why doesn't anybody know about this? This would be a really interesting subject matter, the North Pole of musical instrument repair, um, and that's how it, you know, a lot of. A lot of work, four years of work went into this film. Um, a lot of people put their heart and soul, as you could see, the, the long list of amazing filmmakers at the end, in the end credits. Um, it took a whole whole village to make, make this movie, along with these uh, beautiful people here who brought their smiles and, and talent and, and souls to bear uh, for the film. Chris, can you talk about finding each one of these people and the process for getting them on board. Yeah, so uh, when Ben first went to the repair shop to speak with Steve and the other uh, craftspeople, um, what was so interesting is that uh, they were a little bit trepidatious because they had that you know um, article come out that talked about the backlog and all these things and weren't really the warmest to having people coming in to uh, make a film about the repair shop, essentially. And so Ben went down and gave this rousing speech and... I'm not sure how rousing it was. <laughs> it might have been loud. <laughs> uh, and essentially asked, like, you know, who's with me, essentially? And, and it was the four people that are in the film are the four people that said yes. Uh, so there was no casting process or process of seeing whose story is interesting or more interesting than the other. Uh, these four uh, incredible and incredibly generous people are the ones that stepped forward. And then for the students, we worked with a mentor of mine uh, named Tony White, who runs a lot of all city youth bands here in LA. And we asked him to talk to schools and have them put forward their best and brightest young music students. And uh, <laughs> <laughs> yes, <laughs> enter Porsche. <laughs> Um, Stealing the show once again, for <laughs> <laughs> And uh, we sat with each of them on, on a Zoom, and we were thinking about just getting forward. We ended up uh, interviewing all the students you see at the end. Um, and it was so amazing to have, you know, Portia and all the other students come and, and talk about their love for the instrument. And what was so fascinating for me is that I didn't expect, you know, someone this age to be able to speak with such clarity and, and um, uh, emotion in terms of what, it, what this instrument means to them and, and how important it is. And so it was just such a, a beautiful thing for us to uh, organically find. And I also want to shout out, we have Ismarai and Vincent Womack in the audience. Yes. Please They're stand. also in the film. 
He pumped out that Vince Mariah there on the saxophone, and Vince Lomax, who conducted the end credits. You'll all recognize him, yes, that's right. So I want to turn to the three superstars on the stage, Porsche, Steve, and Dwayne. How has this all been for you? What was the process like of being interviewed by these guys, and how has it been seeing the film up and sharing your stories? Um, well, it's been a little scary, but like after all of the work done and you see the film, it's really nice to see yourself and like all the like you playing and hearing the music and like I did that. <laughs> so it's really nice. Steve, how's it? My turn? It's your turn. <laughs> well, it was unexpected. Um, a little surprising because I was actually waiting for something different, different questions wasn't expecting the, uh, at all uh, the, what's, uh, the questions that Ben was asking. So yeah, in a way, it was surprising, but when uh, we saw the final product, let's say that it was jaw-dropping, wow. So, the way. Uh-oh, my turn. <laughs> <laughs> I like telling this story because it's just amazing. So in the process of in the interview, uh, I was answering the questions and uh, telling stories that had happened, and uh, I mentioned the, about the fiddle and the, and the green case, and uh, and this is I think maybe one o'clock, and you know we're going to close in like a couple hours, and Ben says, "Do you still have that fiddle?" And I said, "Yeah." but it's 70 miles east, you know, where I live. Can you go get it? <laughs> so uh, Dana, who's not here, I miss him. Um, he said, I'll drive. And so uh, my supervisor, Steve, said, you better turn in a couple hours of vacation just in case. <laughs> Gotta cover it. And we zoom home. I call my wife. I said, I have to find this fiddle. And um, I'm digging in my shed and banjos and mandolins and fiddles are falling down and Dana's trying not to get hit. This story gets more embellished every time. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So anyway, we, we, we make it back to the shop. and But it's just the detail I was watching, and I was a, I think I was the last one. I was a nervous wreck all day long. I'm just waiting. It's my turn. I can't talk. And uh, But it, it, yeah, it finally, finally came to my turn, and uh, it, it was just, uh, now see, I lost my train of thought. But um, I, I knew with all the detail, and I was watching Patty and, and, and the other ones, and the cameras doing this, and I'm going, my goodness, this, I don't know what this, it's gonna be an amazing project when it's finished. And it has certainly turned out to be even further than I could even imagine. But there was one question at the very end he asked, and I, I couldn't, couldn't even believe it. He says, Dwayne, is there any way you can get a hold of Frankenstein? <laughs> Actually, that's not true. I made that up. <laughs> but if it was possible, he would make me, I know that he would make me get a hold of him. Well, everybody was very worried that as long as we don't get fired when that documentary comes out, <laughs> well, we're still there. So. I will also just say it's so incredible to meet these folks in the film, but knowing them up close is even more glorious they are incredible people so it's just such an honor to be on this journey with you thank you okay. we're all everyone is yeah. um what the film does so well and every time i watch it i'm reminded of this is it illuminates the life-saving power of music and there's a part where one of the young men set says um you know if we didn't have the sousaphones um, the tubas at the school, you never know. And Porsche makes the joke at the beginning, like, don't jinx me with that. And it always gets me thinking about the very real re real realities of um, music education not being in schools, you know, and how for black and brown kids that often can lead to a decreased sense of purpose, violence, 
um, a whole host of other things. And so I'm curious for everyone on the panel, how music makes you feel playing it, working on the instruments, and maybe even for you and for Ben and Chris, um, sort of what's at stake if we lose musical education in schools? Um, yeah, I mean, answering the first question in terms of what it provides for me, I didn't really realize until I got older how much it was providing um, like therapy before I even thought about going to a therapist, how much it was providing this um, uh, meditation practice. Like there's so much, uh, when I got, actually got into meditation, I was like, wow, this, this reminds me so much of like practicing scales and trying to like focus on my breath and, and slow things down. And, um, and then also whenever I, there's so many things that I take from music and apply it to my life. Uh, I play jazz and the thing I love about jazz in a group setting is listening and playing off of one another. And I feel like that's something that I often reflect on when I'm having conversations with people and I think about how to interact with people and I'm so inspired by that. Um, and also just learning something new or difficult and overcoming something. There's so many pieces of music that I started a practice session thinking I would never be able to play and then you know, took 30 minutes and all of a sudden I could play like, you know, the first two bars or something and, and that felt like this huge accomplishment. And so being able to break something down and I feel like, you know, without arts education, we're losing so much of that. You know, we think about arts education as being this thing that leads to someone becoming a successful musician. And, uh, you know, there's so many studies that have been done that talk about what it provides to kids in terms of um, uh, psychological help, especially in today's time and we're, we have this you know, mental health crisis and, and kids trying to figure out how to navigate social media and whatever else. And I feel like, you know, to have some sort of outlet is so much more important than uh, the idea of using it to become something. Um, especially, like you said, in so many communities where, you know, if just having a, an instrument or some way to create music and express yourself was, was able to um, help someone through a lot of things that they wouldn't be able to talk about anywhere else. I think it's such a huge thing. Um, and then of course, what it does for, you know, we actually just recently did a bunch of, um, a little bit of research into how much it helps with test scores. And, you know, again, people thinking about uh, challenging subject matter or challenging tasks and how much music can help with that or the idea of playing in an ensemble and, and being a part of a community, being part of a group. And so, yeah, I really feel like it's, it's, amazing to get those lessons in an environment where it's almost like a uh, like subtextual uh, thing that you're learning that you know you come out of playing in an orchestra and all of a sudden you think about being a member of society in a different way and so I really feel like that's one of the most valuable things that we'd be losing without uh, arts education yeah. Yeah. I love hearing you talk about that so, I mean for, for me I, I think um, I don't know, it just kind of reminds me that I have a heart. You know, when I listen to music, I, I can get really in my head, and um, I think when I listen to music, or I listen to a lot of film scores over and over again a lot of times, um, it reminds me to get out of my head and get into my emotions, get into my most empathetic self, which I think is kind of our highest self. Um, and, um, and I think when I was young, kid, I liked the thrill of music, like I loved, you know, I li loved listening to John Williams and just like the most thrilling, exciting possible music that I couldn't imagine that life or existing could be that exciting. Um, and now I really like, you know, music that uh, has a resolution because it's because life does not <laughs> a, lot, a lot of times. Um, and I'm and I'm looking for those things that I'm almost missing, they're like vitamin uh, uh, emotions that I'm missing. Um, in my life and looking for them in music. And so, I mean, that's just sort of like a little drop, a taste into the world of probably what everybody experiences in their personal relationship to music. Um, but the longer and more mature that, that relationship is, I think the better. Um, the earlier we start thinking about it, it's the earlier we start reflecting in our own personal world of what we think and what we feel and what we want to devote our time and and uh, I also think it lends itself to generosity and giving the gift of music if you can play something uh, to someone else, uh, which we need a lot more of. Um, what do you think, Portia? What do you, what do you like about music? Um, well, it definitely helps you calm down. Like, if you've been in school all day, just sitting down, doing work, you can go home to your 
instrument and play this nice sound. <laughs> yeah, and it just helps you calm down after a long day. Mm. Absolutely. Yeah. Right, directly from the source. Steve, do you want to add anything? Um, uh, it's proven, like Chris said, uh, that music changes lives, how music changes um, kids' di uh, discipline in, get in school. And um, I mean, it's not really calms you down. Uh, when I was playing music, uh, it's like all the students mentioned in the uh, uh, film that it keeps you focused. Like piano player uh, um, a student said, keeps you focused, disciplined again, and it just, uh, you feel different. In our case, in the cities like Los Angeles, it's not only uh, music is important emotionally, it's important, look how many kids are off the streets. I mean, keeping LAUSD, I'm really thankful that I'm part of it because it's not because I work there, it's because of what I do. Because at the end of the day, when I, when I started as a piano tutor and I saw those little hands playing the piano and it was, my friend, not to make this long, when I was thinking, I moved here from Washington State in 20, uh, 2002, 2002, and I was kind of like, oh, do I really want to move to California, LA, uh, I don't know. And my friend lived here, he still lives here, and he said, Steve, come on, it's like Lakers calling you, man. <laughs> what are you thinking about? So you're playing in a small team there, and Lakers calling, you know what, it really, if, I mean, I don't know, I think it's more than Lakers because at the end of the day when I know that all these instruments going back to students and wonderful teachers like uh, Vince Womack sitting here that do this magic, you know, it, it feels different. It's music changes kids' lives, but in our end, it changes our lives when we see what those instruments do for kids. It's, it's a wonderful feeling, thank you. And uh, I'm just gonna mention the fact, uh, when I was really young, the, the, you know, watching the Frankenstein thing, it, it, I'm going, wow. So it helps you realize that you never know what when a student decides to want to play an instrument, you never know what it is that, you know, that gives them that idea. Maybe it's something they heard. Um, but I always think that even if it's the smallest little urge to play, I feel so uh, lucky that I learned how to fix these instruments and I have this incredible job. E even before this documentary was made, I, I remember at the, uh, I wouldn't always tell a supervisor, Steve, I know what his name is, how much I enjoy working there. But um, to make the instrument play you know, as well as it possibly can so that student has the best chance to, uh, to continue on. So it's, it's very fulfilling and music is just, just wonderful. I mean, I don't know what else to say. Yeah, yeah it's hard to yeah. Well, the score in the film is incredible. So Ben and Chris, Talk to us about the process of creating the score for the film and um, how that also is informed by the structure of the film and like which instruments we hear when. And Yeah, so we have to talk about Kazi Richardson, uh, who also went to USC. Uh, yes, and um, so Ben and I talked about wanting to bring on another composer just to have another perspective. Also, having a female composer felt incredibly important with a film like this in terms of talking about access and equal access. And um, uh, what we did is I gave her just the themes for each of the characters, uh, just a piano version of the theme. And then we talked to her about uh, making sure that each section highlighted the instrument uh, department that we were talking about. So with Dana, the score was much uh, infused with strings and then brass of patty and so on and so forth. And 
uh, and then those themes are the themes that come together in that end credits piece that I wrote uh, at the end. But for me, it was just so amazing having another collaborator because I think had I scored the film, I personally don't know if it would have been as good. I don't. I, I feel like <laughs> it's no, just the Kanye way just, just knocked it out of the park. Yeah, her her uh, compositional ability is really incredible, and it's amazing to have another perspective. That's why I love collaboration because you know I wouldn't have approached it this way, and and it is a better film because of how she approached it. And so it was a, a real joy to work with her. I also have to mention because everybody always asks us about this end credit sequence, which was a, which was a later addition. Uh, we actually made the film first, and then later we got news that it had gotten into Telluride Film Festival, which is like this mind-blowing, incredible news. And we kind of uh, people had actually said, "I see, I see Don O'Keefe over here, um, who I met through my professor uh, Jim O'Keefe, who who teaches here." And I remember Don saying, "She, she, we worked together at, at Breakwater Studios." Don saying, "You need a performance at the end." You need a performance. You need. We need to see the kids perform. You need a performance at the end. And I said, Oh no, the film's done. It's already in the film fest. We said, You need a performance at the end. Um, so we, we go back and oh, we gotta have. We should have a performance at the end. What should we do? What should we do? It would be great if we get the alumni together. And so the ideal, the idea started snowballing. And basically, by the time uh, it came down to it, we had picked the date. We had all these LAUSD players coming in. People donating their time. Peter Rotter, our amazing executive producer, um, Jane Solomon was instrumental in pulling us all together, all at the last minute. And we still didn't have uh, a conductor. We still didn't have a conductor, and we were just talking about this. And it was like, you, you, you would remember, uh, but I think it was maybe 48 hours or something like that before, maybe one day before, frankly. Uh, this big performance with a 100-piece orchestra, this very complex piece of music, and we're trying to find a conductor and we go out and we somehow manage by some grace of God to get Vince Womack as our conductor and came in. Can you believe that? And I remember, I remember walking in there on the stage and he was like, I crashed this down last night. This is a great piece of music. Looking forward to conducting it. And that's him conducting it for the first time to this whole group and that's them playing it for the first time. I mean, that's the amazing thing. If you don't know, yeah, please. We have here in Los Angeles is this incredible community of musicians who can just, I mean, if you've ever been to a uh, scoring session with some of these musicians, it just blow your socks off. They just, you know, you can't believe they can just do it the first or second time. You know, Chris wrote that piece of music in like two or three days, you know? And the people, they're just people walking around Los Angeles. Um, <laughs> You know, I don't think we could do that in Nova Scotia. Uh, <laughs> other things, yes, but it's a very special thing. And I just, you know, you can't see that in the movie, but I always like to say that, because it's just, it's a, it's a miracle what, what uh, composers and musicians and conductors and music teachers and all the people that go into the mix of these, this amazing world of music, it's, uh, it's unbelievably inspiring, endlessly so. We also can't talk about structure without mentioning Nick Wright, who's in the audience. He was the editor on the Where film. is he? Yeah. He's in Where the is back. Nick? There he is back there. Give him a huge round of applause. Yeah. He spent four years editing this movie. Four years of his life. He had a child in the process. <laughs> okay, I have one more question, and then we'll go out to the audience. Um, it's for Steve and Dwayne. And I, what of the repair shop in like 15 to 20 years? Like when you imagine what the repair shop is and what it can be, is there a vision that you have for it? Steve, your eyes are getting wide. Vision is, for 21 years, my vision was, you're gonna retire in 21 years. <laughs> March 5th, 2024. And now when it's right here, the March of 24, I go like, I can't do this. <laughs> I've been uh, supervising the shop for, what is it, uh, from 2017, seven years. It's gonna be seven years uh, this summer. It's kind of like it becomes a real family and it's really hard. I can't even imagine I'm leaving, uh, but 
I mean proud that with God's help, what I'm leaving in the shop, if I leave in March, which I don't think is going to happen, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> but I'm shop is in really good condition right now. And with this film, what happens, now many people know that the shop exists because we have district administrators that didn't know the shop exists. <laughs> I mean, I'm not talking just in employees, uh, principals. Well, I mean, I'm talking higher rank administrators that had no idea. They even mentioned that, we thought we killed you. Well, we're still there. <laughs> but anyway, I see the shop since now we have over 136,000 instruments, not 80,000, because recently there was a purchase of 50,000 more instruments by Arts and Education. So it makes, wow. thank you. It's, it, yeah, I mean, LAU is the, probably there's many uh, 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 graduates here too, right? From LAUSD graduates? Yeah, there you go. Um, LAUSD is proud to be the one in the nation who has a shop like this. And we're all proud to be part of it. And as long as kids are going to school and music programs exist, shop is going to be there. It's been there for 66 years, so it's going to be there. That's what I see. Thank you. Thank you for your support. And thank you, Ben, Chris, and Breakwater Studios. Uh, it, it was very unexpected. Like I mentioned earlier, we didn't know what kind of film it's going to be. We had some interviews before, TV stations and news stations, short uh, takes and stuff. But basically, I personally thought it's going to be one of those just uh, regular kind of like a cut. Well, like I mentioned, it was jaw-dropping wow. And uh, now since community sees that, they know there's this shop. They know that there's this music program. They know that there's teachers there. And Chris is a perfect example of uh, um, many famous musicians graduated from LA Unified. It's just amazing uh, um, district, and I really appreciate all the support we get from maintenance and operation, from uh, um, the superintendent of uh, Mr. Carvalho. It's just, it's, it's great, uh, um, especially after this film. It's just, you know, we can ask anything we want now. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, all guys. Okay, we're going to go ask the audience, but to kick us off, I wanted to start with our partners for this event. So I'd like to invite to the, the mic the director of the USC Institute of Armenian Studies, Dr. Karapetian, <laughs> followed by the founder and CEO of the Armenian Film Society, Armin. Thank you everyone for such a lovely experience. Um, Los Angeles is known for many things, including hosting the largest Armenian population in the world outside of Armenia. Um, the last three years have been catastrophic for the Armenian community worldwide. And the war that Steve lost his father to continued into a 30 year conflict that then culminated in 2020 in a devastating war and just a few months ago to the complete ethnic cleansing of Armenians in a historic Armenian homeland. Um, I was just telling Steve right before, I think for three years, I had been holding in my trauma, uh, unable to grieve because I was so bu busy dealing with it and seeing Steve's story just triggered something where I was just bawling like a child in the privacy of my bedroom. Um, I'm curious, Steve, for you as a member of this very important community um, and also for the rest of you in the film, what making this film, you probably filmed it before all of this unfolded, but the kind of screening of this film in this particular moment of collective grief and trauma for this community, what that means like and what Angelino's reactions have been 
particularly to Steve's storyline in the context of what's happening in the Armenian world. Thank you so much. Um, it's really emotional question. Always has been for me. Always will be. Um, it's a tragic to what, what happened started in 86 and continue on to these days. Um, I don't know, I just, uh, I just wanted to people know. And I wasn't kind of thinking what it's gonna do, what is my story gonna do, how many hearts is gonna touch. I wasn't thinking about that. It's, I always said, everyone has a story. Ben said, at our first screening, I remember said, you stop anyone out in the street and everyone has a story. The magic is to ask the right question to pull the story out. That's what Ben did. I was, when I was answering these questions that Ben was asking, in an interview, I didn't know where it goes, to be honest with you. But when he asked that right question about what I was born and about the family, uh, you don't hear the questions here in the film. <coughs> After the interview was done, I had this very um, interesting feeling that it's like something is inside of me, something happened to me. When I saw the film first time, I broke in tears too, and I still do. And it's just, um, it hurts. It will hurt. Dana mentioned uh, at his interview that we can fix things, but not human lives. We can't fix that. That's something that takes time. Well, it's been almost 35, well actually 35 years since it happened to my father. It still hurts. <laughs> so, people need to know not only about what's going on in Armenia, uh, everywhere in the world, the people suffering, there's people dying, there's wars. That's terrible. This is what people need to see. Music is what people need to uh, hear, what need to be involved with. Art, that's what sports, that's what has no borders. And if I could play that little part for to help my community and Angelinos or anybody in the world, I'm thankful for that. I don't know if I asked you the question, but thank you. Um, first, I'd like to thank everyone for coming out and being a part of this uh, uh, screening, and I'd love to uh, thank all of the filmmakers and everyone involved with the film. Um, thank you for being here. Thank you for sharing this film with us. Um, and uh, thanks for being here for this discussion. Um, it was 15 years ago this year that Ben and I uh, had a class in this very same room as USC students. So this is a very special moment for me personally to have the Armenian Film Society co-present the screening with all of you. Um, to go off what Dr. Carpentin was saying, I'd like to ask Chris and Ben, was there any um, was there any concern, was there any caution on your end, um, considering that Steve's story involves you know, such violence from a part of the world that's typically ignored in American media and um, uh, headlines, was there any concern on your part in terms of how you delved into that story, um, if at all, on your end? Um, no. I, 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 um, we wanted to tell the story as Steve told it. Um, and, you know, that's our job. Our, our job is to listen to, it doesn't have to be our job, but I think we, we choose for it to be our job, 
that we listen to someone tell their life story and we choose our job to be present present that story in the best way possible as we believe the intended. Um, what what did they emphasize? Uh, what what if they could be filmmakers with a big crew? How would they make tell their own story? Uh, that's how we approach it. Um, and so it was important uh, for us to tell the story exactly how you know Steve told it. Um, even even to the point of of the of the people arm in arms who helped him to the airport who were his Azerbaijani friends. Um, and those are the kind of details that we felt were really important to tell. And, um, you know, it's, all, it's also our job as, as documentary filmmakers to tell stories that don't often get told, to recognize those stories, to uh, help give them a platform and, and space, space like this, for everybody to stop and think and consider so that maybe later on you might pay a little bit more attention or do a little bit more research or or hold in your heart space enough to empathize with somebody on the other side of the planet. Um, and yeah, you know, we were, we were in solidarity with Steve from the beginning and, and thus with, with the, uh, the Armenian community and the Armenian diaspora here in Los Angeles. Yeah, totally. I think that, um, you know, for Steve and everyone involved to be so vulnerable uh, and sharing their lives like Ben said, our duty was to make sure that that vulnerability felt honored. Um, I think it's also the fact that we were making this film on our own uh, for so long so that we didn't have any uh, studio or distributors or producers that were telling us you know, what should be in, what should be out of the film. Uh, this was purely like, we just want to honor these individuals and we feel like their lives are, are important and worth putting on that platform. And so I think because of that being the North Star, um, it also seemed like uh, a no-brainer to, to make sure that that was included. Yeah, I should also say, I think we get credit for being, uh, you know, brave or telling a story. We were just telling Steve's story. Um, and, and like you suggested, we've, we filmed this story four years ago, before all the recent history. And so, um, the, the person who deserves credit here, the person who's vulnerable, the person who lived through it, um, who, who bared his soul is, is, is Steve. You know, we, we just had the camera on and did our best to, to service his story. And so all the credit should go to him. Yeah. Are there any other questions? Can we hear some Anyone can line up at the microphone. And thank you, Armin. I remember being in those classes with you 15 years ago. Let's do this again in 15 years. <laughs> Hi, sorry. Uh, not really a question, just more for your listening ears. My name is Adeline Alvarez. I am partially in a UC baby. I graduated high school class of 2020. But more so what I wanted to talk about is how when I was in fifth grade, I went to Russell Elementary School. And a teacher came into our classroom and they kind of pitched this whole concept of a music group. And so they, they gave out flyers, asked the elementary, the fifth little fifth graders what instrument they wanted to play. And I was like, I was 10 years old, approximately four feet tall, and I chose a cello. And so the teacher was like, yeah, I don't really think you can play a cello. You're four feet tall, how are you going to hold it? And I was like, well, if I want to do it, let me do it. <laughs> essentially, they decided no. <laughs> And I think this goes to kind of answer your question of what if, what if there were no instruments, what if they were stolen from us, what if this opportunity was not there, and I just think that that's one of the many questions, one of the many answers to that question, just because as of that moment, I'm not very, I'm not a creative person, but I do very much enjoy the arts, which is why I'm here. I'm actually a student here, but I'm an economics major, so nothing to do. It's just one of my interests. So I guess to kind of elaborate on the answer to that question is the what if is you'll always feel that emptiness. You'll always feel that you were deprived of something. You will always feel not knowing that part of yourself that you could have if you were allowed to express yourself in that way. But anyway, that was all. Thank you. Yeah, that's that. Thank you. <clears throat>
Good evening. Uh, thank you for being here and for your answers and this beautiful movie. Uh, first, uh, I've been playing trumpet for years, so I really relate to I lost a random object in my instrument port. And um, so my, my question is, um, was it uh, your vision from the beginning to have this uh, principal focus on the lives of the different people working in this shop or was it with the interviews little by little that you understood that you had to put these lives at the center of the repair shop or was it basically uh, in originally um, uh, you, you wanted it to be focused on other things so how did it came to be this way? Yeah, great, great question. Um, no. Initially, I think what was interesting, obviously, was the visuals of repairing an instrument. Um, I've been lucky, I've made a lot of craftspeople films, They're, it's a great you know, subject. Documentary filmmakers make films about craftspeople because it's, the, the internal becomes external when whatever they're making with their hands. And so that was the initial draw and, and, the, and the generosity of the shop. Um, it, it was only after sitting down and hearing the stories did we realize, oh my goodness me, it's not just uh, a whole, one home run, it's, it's a grand slam, bases loaded. Uh, all four of these people have amazing stories and are great storytellers. And there was a, one theme that was through all of them, which is they themselves were broken and repaired you know, by music and uh, didn't go looking for it, didn't write it, didn't think we would get it. Um, and it came out of the spirit of the shop, which is a really important thing as a documentary filmmaker. You have your plans when you go in, but you have to be willing to throw the plans out when something much better appears. Um, and it always appears uh, if you're listening closely enough. And then it was really a process of honing it. Nick Wright, the editor, for years and years, figuring out what goes in, what goes out, which order should they be in, this first, that first, which you know uh, length of uh, movie are we going to make? Is it a short? Is it a feature? Et cetera, et cetera. Going back and forth on all these things for a long time, <laughs> watching this movie. Um, that those are the moments when you make all these micro decisions. That but the essence of the thing was was the emotion, and in this movie, the emotion was in. Porsche and Steve and Dwayne and, and our other uh, storytellers in the film for sure. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, my name is Shubra. I'm a USC film student here. Um, thank you so much for being here. It's so cool to see you on this platform and me in the same shoes you were in. Um, <clears throat> it's a beautiful, beautiful movie. It's beautiful, at least sounding. It's just a beautiful story. Um, but it's so beautiful visually. Um, and I remember this one shot in the beginning where we're like seeing through the holes of an instrument and then out pops someone's eye. And it's just so, it's, I remember thinking, wow, like they really trust these filmmakers so much to be able to get such an invasive, for lack of a better word, yeah, shot. Yeah, we had to bring a cello for <laughs> Exactly, yeah, that's crazy. Um, and so incredible that we got that kind of perspective. Um, and I was wondering, I mean, this is a question for everyone. Um, how is the trust building process for that? How did you build trust with, you know, these people? And how did you guys feel, um, you know, getting to know these filmmakers? Uh, may may uh -huh. I say something? <laughs> go for it, go for it. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> It's, it's uh, um, like I mentioned before, when I saw the detail, they were so interested in, in the detail, and I'm thinking that they're really going to be able to portray this shop as it, as it is. And so it was just the, the details that when I was watching, since I was the last, I had a chance to really watch it. It was so amazing, so interesting, and so... Yeah, the, the, the details that, that you guys were considering and I watched you guys do that was amazing. I was always asking Muskie, why is he asking this? Why does he need this? Why he wants me to break a string? Why is he wanting to break a cello? Um, then one of the guys told me, Steve, just do what Ben says, trust me. Just trust me. So I did. And I'm glad I did. So it's 
yeah, the details um, that were amazing, and that through the F hole, that was one of my favorites too at the beginning of the film. So yeah, it, it was just amazing experience because at the beginning, like I mentioned before, I just thought it's going to be another questions answers, another like 10, 15 minute interview thing. But when it all started, I went, oops, that's something different. I got one, one more thing, I promise. Um, the, the, I asked Dana, I said, how did you guys get that smoke inside that violin? And he said, no, that wasn't smoke, that was the dust. And I'm going, oh my gosh, it's just it's yeah, it so amazing. The dust and all this, yeah. Um, well, it was actually, it was really scary at first, and then, like, it was the first interview, and I was like, okay, uh, but playing violin for them, whatever. And then the second interview, I was like, um, <laughs> I'm back. <laughs> and then once I went to the studio, I'm like, okay, this is serious. <laughs> and then they were recording me, and now... <laughs> what, was, what was your name? Shubra. Shubra. Thank you for your question. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, we we just we just honestly were interested, you know, and I think that was pretty clear from the beginning that we just really wanted to tell the story of the shop and put it on camera. And we wanted to make it look as cool and wonderful and amazing and magical as it was to all of us there at the time. And we wanted to bring all of our tools of cinematography and music and sound design, et cetera, to the table. And my guess is that somehow that, we didn't say that, but it somehow melted through. And I think, you know, when, when Dwayne says, you know, they were really interested in the details, there'll never be anybody more detail oriented than people who can fix a piano or a, or a saxophone. So I think there was a, a kindred spirit sense between us. Um, and uh, we wanted to know how the shop worked. The same way, at some point, you wanted to know how a piano worked or how a saxophone worked. And I think, um, and I think the same was true. And I remember watching Chris and Porsche talk. Um, you know, probably, I would assume that you probably saw something of yourself you know, as a little kid picking up an instrument too. Yeah, I think definitely that. And, and um, you know, I've learned so much from, from Ben. This is our second film together, but, you know, he's been doing this for, for a long time. And I think the thing that's so amazing is in just speaking to people, interviewing people, there's this um, just childlike wonder, this kind of, you know, um, this idea of like everything being the first time you know, we, we just did a, uh, uh, an interview at the shop uh, with George um, uh, Pinocchio. And um, the way that Ben talks about the shop is as if, like, he's been working in this shop for years. Like, there's so much <laughs> love and, and joy and excitement that goes into it. And it's so genuine. I remember we interviewed my grandfather, and he's getting my grandfather to do stuff in the dry cleaners that um, my grandfather's like, this doesn't make sense, dry cleaners. <laughs> but he would do it because, like, the energy that goes into it. And I feel like... Um, you know, one of the things I learned from Ben in interviewing people, the first question is, you know, what is your first memory? And to, to start talking to someone from that place, not like, you know, um, from this in, interrogation place, but this place of like, I want to get to know you. Like, tell me about your life and tell me about, you know, your childhood and all this stuff. I think it, it creates this warmth that uh, develops a lot of trust from those conversations pretty early on. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you. Hello, my name is Anna. I just want to say that was a precious, precious story. Um, it definitely touched me personally. Um, my family grew up in the Soviet Union as well, so um, as the immigrant story is very near and dear to my heart, and that was extremely touching. Um, I was wondering, for people aspiring to make documentary filmmakers, what are those magical questions that you keep talking about? Um, and what are some of the surprising ones that you maybe didn't expect you needed to ask, but you asked, and that came up with the best story? Yeah, you want to know the, the truth? You want to know the real, the real secret yes. questions? Okay, here we go. Um, the, 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 the answer is, the, the, best the best thing that you can do is don't say a word. 
that's the best thing you can do, which is crazy. It's crazy. It's the opposite to what you think. But when somebody starts sharing your story, remember, close your mouth. Mm -hmm. That is the best thing you can do and listen and sit there and be comfortable in 10, 20, 30, 40 seconds of silence, which is very difficult, but you do it. And as you mature as a filmmaker, you realize that if somebody pauses 30 seconds and says something, the next thing they say will be amazing. Mm -hmm. And so silence is your friend. Um, there's a misnomer about directing that you got to have, have all these clever questions, right? You, you're going to trick people into you know, telling them all your secrets or whatever, or you're going to have this incisive, really smart question about where you really show expertise about you know, some part of a musical instrument or whatever to prove to the other person that you are the right person to direct the movie. It's actually the total opposite. Being curious, being someone who knows nothing. What do you mean? How does a piano work? What's that? Where is that? You know, really ask very basic questions because then they'll explain it to you and thus they are explaining it to the audience so the audience gets the experience of learning something. So it's not being an expert, it's, it's being the opposite of that and really soaking up all the information on behalf of the eventual audience. That's, that's the key. So silence and naivete. Silence and naivete are your best friend as a documentary director, I would say. Thank yeah. You. Yeah, of course. I do three more questions and I will. Um, hi, my name is Jill. Um, I'm here with my editing class and professor. Um, I just wanted to say like um, the film was like really touching and like the whole time I was watching it I just kept thinking like I should have started the piano or something in fourth grade. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, I I missed my opportunity. But um, one of the things that um, I noticed is like there were so many heartfelt moments um, within the film um, from um, the different people working at the shop. But like one of the sequences that really stood out to me was Dwayne's because of just like the change in tempo. I just thought it was like um, like really entertaining to see like the different like photos composed of like how um, how like once you got your fiddle, then you started your band, and then like you started playing here, and then you opened for Elvis. And I was just like, this is so this is like so interesting, and just like so like captivating of like that whole sequence. And I was just wondering, as um, directors, I'm not sure if this is like more of a director editing question, but how did you feel like that fit into like the overall narrative, and like how did you place it into the overall narrative? If that makes sense. Yeah. yeah, in terms of uh, the pace, I mean, that's all Nick for sure, just in terms of um, uh, making it match the way that Dwayne's telling a story uh, and the energy of that. But also, the placement of it really was just trial and error. Like, we literally watched this movie. We always knew that Steve was going to be the end, given that, you know, it was a nice reveal that this, this uh, manager of the shop, you know, uh, Kind of feels like the bean counter that ends up having this amazing uh heart-wrenching breathtaking story um so we knew we had that but we literally tried every iteration of the other three stories and this is just the one that naturally felt uh right for, for whatever reason yeah i would also say that the duane story is fun right it's exciting it's fun it's funny you know, there's every time we screen the movie and, and uh, the colonel comes on, there's sort of a gasp of the emotion. Oh my, you know, the, the story keeps going. It's this unbelievable thing that just makes you smile. And, um, and it's, it's nice to remember sort of the fun of, of it too, right? There's a lot of really beautiful emotional elements, but at some point you also have to release and have some fun. And uh, Dwayne and his $20 fiddle, um, <laughs> Which is here, by the way. That's it. Wow. If we're lucky, he'll play. If you're very nice, he'll play a, a ditty. Um, it, it, that's, I think, in the end, what felt right about it was it was a nice, um, just a cleanser uh, before going in for that final, um, those final moments with Steve. Um, but yeah, you should introduce yourself to Nick Wright. He's at the back in the hat. Now that I point him out, he won't leave. And you can meet one of the best editors who walk in the face of the earth. He's right at the back there. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, um, I'm Annette Johnson. And I actually uh, graduated from Berkeley College of Music in 2021. I moved out here 
to LA two years ago and was, you know, been trying to break into the industry. I also used to sing professionally. Um, I, I performed with the Santa Fe Opera when I was 10 and I played the violin since I was three. And I guess the reason why I bring this up is music for me has always been very, this big career thing, this thing ha that has kind of been this terrifying thing. And even though, you know, I loved it growing up, I think for me growing up, it kind of became somewhat stale because it only became about a career. I Even last year, I was uh, talking to this one composer and he literally looked me dead in the eye and said, fame is kind of important. And that has been kind of the messaging that I've been constantly given throughout my life. And I think I just wanted to tell you how much I appreciated this film because um, I kind of, you know, I'm trying not to lose my love of music. It's really hard. You know, I don't know why, but like, it's just like I want that magic not to go away, you know? And it's really scary because it's like, you go into it and you're like, you, you know, I'll play the violin and sometimes I'll just cry because I feel dead playing it rather than feeling anything because all, all that matters now is being successful and getting money and, and, and making sure people like you and, and it's all about people's opinions of you. It's not about your experience anymore. And I think I needed to see this film today because, you know, it's like, it's, it's so nice to see a film that comes from this perspective of what music was originally supposed to be. It was supposed to be a way of sharing, it was supposed to be a way of healing, and it was also a, supposed to be a way of being able to exist and communicate without constantly having to like play like social games in a way you can actually be honest. And I just wanted to be, um, I just wanted to thank you for kind of letting me see a little bit of that and experience a little bit of that again. So yeah, thank you. Thank you. Hello all. Um, I wasn't sure what I wanted to say when I got up here, but I felt compelled to get up um, because you never know whose life you may touch by sharing. Um, I played five instruments. It w my first was the flute when I was four, and it would have also included the harpsichord if I had hung, hung around long enough for my music teacher to finish building it. But um, music for me represented a refuge from the traumas that I had to deal with as a child. But sadly, it also represented those traumas. So when I no longer had to be there, I left them all behind. And now I have limitations with the shoulders and the wrists, so I can't play the flute or the viola or the piano or the clarinet anymore. But I have been having pulled at my heartstrings. Oh, oh, I forgot to tell you this part. Seventh grade all of the violins got snatched up. And so the, the viola was like the booby prize, I thought. Um, if I would have stuck with that, I might be a violist in a symphony by now, you know? So I lament the fact that I did it. In the, in the meantime, I'll be 64 years old this year and I have fallen in love with Yo-Yo Ma and Sheku Kane Mason, and I am bound and determined to learn to play the freaking cello. Yes. And play it well. <laughs> and it all stems back to that viola in seventh grade. All of the other instruments were, were meaningful to me, but for some reason the viola is the one that stuck. And I'm, I can't play it anymore, but I'm gonna play its close cousin. <laughs> so I wanted to thank you all for the contributions that you've made from the music teacher and conductor, especially. I have such, um, my life has been so touched by my, my choir and chamber singers teacher in high school, as well as my music teacher in junior high. 
And I want to thank the people who chose to tell the story, to have the courage and the fortitude to tell the story, and the people about whom the story is about. I'm a, I'm a private elder caregiver, and one of my favorite clients was an, is an Armenian man. Um, and I can't wait to tell him about you. <laughs> I cannot wait. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you very much. Thank you. thank you all so much for your beautiful and thoughtful questions and comments. We're going to end with Dwayne playing us a little something. All right. <laughs> Formal name of the shop. And I use this musical instrument repair shop. It's only one. And I use the musical instrument repair shop. Yes. Give a big round of applause for Dwayne Michael. When we were filming this, I watched Porsche, and I'm going, and then my part was going to come up soon, and I'm going, how can she, how can she just sit there and not be nervous and just play? Oh, I was scared to death that day. By the way, excuse me, when Ben said that it's all that concert part happened very quick, I got a call the night before. Yes. Night before. Oh, by the way, Steve, you're going to play that part. <laughs> I'm going to piano. I can't play. Well, I will send the piano teacher to your house right now. <laughs> it's true. True story. Can you hear the violin okay? Okay. Great.